Aloha and welcome to World of Books, a talk show on good books that we think you should read. I'm your host, Mihaila Stoops, and today's topic is poverty and what can we do about it? Wars, natural disasters, um, a worldwide pandemic have not only exposed poverty, but have also pushed more people into poverty. Today's book is co-authored by Ruby Payne, Philip DeVall, Terry Drusy Smith, and Eugene Krebs, and it is called Bridges Out of Poverty. It is at its fifth edition, and it even has an update uh, regarding COVID on um, its effects on poverty. My guest today is my good friend, Jeannie Frank. Jeannie and I met through the Maui Prep Book Club, uh, and we've read many books, many good books, and we've had some wonderful conversations over time. Jeannie is a very accomplished adoption and surrogacy attorney. She has more than 30 years experience in this area of expertise, and she runs offices in um, Oklahoma, Colorado, and New York. Jeannie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Well, let's dive into it. And let's talk about the definition of poverty. This is a rather relative term. And I want to start our, our conversation um, with you sharing with us your experience in your business and in your personal life with poverty. What kind of cases have you come across and what kind of poverty have you come across growing up? Well, um, the, the fact is I grew up in Oklahoma in a rural uh, environment and um, I came from situational poverty from my mother, um, which also happened to my grandmother where the men in their family had died young, usually in their early 40s or 50s, um, leaving the women destitute, even though um, my grandmother's family was actually very wealthy at one time. Um, because of situations like death, um, for generations, um, then it threw everyone into poverty. And so I grew up actually on a small three acre plot of land where we grew and canned everything. Um, and what we didn't have, we traded uh, for, and uh, my uncles would hunt and bring in uh, the little bit of meat that we had. And so um, I grew up, uh, with uh, my grandmother and my mother would not uh, take any type of welfare. So uh, they uh, would work part time when they could. And then we would survive off of uh, my grandmother's Social Security, you know, from uh, retirement. And then my mom bringing in a little bit of money when she worked part time. So um, things were scarce. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so poverty. Uh, I, I, I grew up uh, with a little of nothing. I, I didn't even have any uh, clothes that were from a store until after age 12, when I, you know, I really started throwing a fit about that. Now, of course, I'd like a tailor. <laughs> I can't afford one. Uh, but uh, well, yeah. lack of financial resources would be uh, the definition of the poverty that you've encountered uh, as a child. I think so. Um, I, the one the reason that I love this book and um, that I wanted to, uh, when you asked me about doing this interview, that it was so special to me is that um, living through poverty and seeing um, not only financial, but uh, how you struggled out of poverty. My family had a plan for me to get out of poverty since I was five years old. And um, for, for me, that was music. Um, my great aunt had, um, her family, like I said, had been wealthy and uh, they sent her to Chicago School of Music. And because of that, she went all over the United States and uh, got all this training and she was a music teacher um, in Bartonville, Oklahoma, where right a town next to where I lived. And so every um, week we would actually go up there for piano lessons since age five. And um, 
there was a litany of things that I needed to do to actually throughout those years in order to actually escape poverty. And, and that plan worked. Um, and so a lot of people uh, actually do get out of poverty through uh, various types of, you know, uh, skill sets, um, sometimes uh, athletics. Uh, a lot of people uh, will get out through athletics, but some people will get out through music or uh, they're very intelligent and they have an opportunity um, to to show that and to go to different uh, events and they will have mentors. And that is one of the main things that uh, I believe this book brings and hits home that uh, to climb out of poverty, you're going to need mentors. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I enjoy this book exactly for this reason, because it points out that it's not just uh, poverty. It's not just lack of financial resources. It's actually lack of mentorship, lack of support. It could be child care. It could be transportation, um, yeah. relation, lack of relationships. Um, and it it shows that essentially we all could do something about it because, you know, not living in poverty any longer. Um, right. We we can help those, if not with money, with definitely with mentorship and other kind of support. Right. This book, um, in general, is such a great. Um, it explains it in a layman's point of, of view, not only for just an individual reading the book, but mainly for uh, organizations out there that are in the community that are trying to help the poor. We have so many organizations that. Uh, will try to help by throwing money at something and then not doing other things that are necessary. Um, I think that those organizations are ill-trained in the fact of what poverty is and um, how you're going to actually help people and not just give them something for today. Um, and that's why this book, um, there are so many strategies and skills in it for uh, organizations such as social workers, uh, doctors, nurses, things like that, who can actually um, help people on a daily basis with little tiny things um, that is so important. You don't have to be a PhD to do that. And it, the, the book also includes a lot of advice for companies that employ people living in poverty because these these people, their life is summarized by this concept of the tyranny of the moment, meaning that, you know, something happens and then the entire um, life rhythm is upended. And as an employer, if your employee is going through this, then you'll find yourself in the same situation, meaning uh, you, under the tyranny of the moment, having to figure out how to bring in additional help and so on. So it, it's a book that it's good for us as community members. It's good for nonprofits that work with people yes. living in poverty, and also for companies that employ these people. Yes. Well, I think that in the book, it, it does show that, um, you know, first line and um, skills for the workers and for people who actually come into contact with people in poverty and in your employment. Um, you want to know how to speak to people um, and how to explain things to people. Uh, whereas the language, and this book um, has a great little chart about the language, how it's different uh, in poverty versus um, what middle class people speak. And explaining their jobs, uh, having somebody who actually they can go to that's maybe assigned to them in the first month of employment. Uh, they can ask questions and they can actually get uh, the timing of the job. Many people believe that people in poverty are stupid, but the fact of the matter is, is they're not. They're, they're just like you and I on the intelligence scale. They're going to test the same. It's just the fact that they haven't had the opportunity and they just don't know the rules. And so this book um, talks about what all the rules are and how as a social worker, as a somebody who works for a not-for-profit, how you can really help them. And that's what I love about this book. Yes, the hidden rules, the, the yeah. things that one needs to know to move actually up or down uh, right. in social status. And one of the worksheets in the, in the book 
really got me thinking, it was a set of questions about uh, one's ability to live in poverty. So there were questions like, do you know how to um, access various agencies for all sorts of documents that you may lose in the process of you know, all these um, traumatic events you may be going through? Do you know how to hide your car from debt collectors? <laughs> do you know... Uh, do you know where, what are the um, churches that may offer meals and so on? That's right. all this. All these. Do you know how to move in the middle of the night at a moment's notice and you know make sure that you got everything you need? Basically, that was a long list of questions, and it it just led me to um, believe, and I agree with you that people in poverty actually have to be more creative have to yeah. figure it out figure it out faster it this is being in, in living in poverty is not about being intelligent it's lack of support and it could right. be financial it could be um social capital it could be health it could be language relationships and so on yes i mean in my work what we try to do to help pregnant moms is to get them an id and while you think gosh that's so simple the fact is, to get an ID, you need a birth certificate. And to get a birth certificate, you have to have a litany of things to be able to do it and to prove who you are. And that's pretty uh, problematic when you have no ID at all. And so we have a, a whole set of systems that can help people get an ID because you can't go to work without an ID. So it, it's like this circle <laughs> of blockages for helping them to get a job. And, um, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that they mentioned in the book that I uh, saw firsthand growing up was churches. Churches are a first line of help uh, to people in general, uh, to kids, to going to their programs, to getting meals at the church, which was a big deal. Um, because you might be able to, depending on the Wednesday night service or a special event for children, which they generally have at least once a month, but Wednesday night, they usually have a meal. Sunday night, sometimes they have a meal. Um, that's a big, big deal for people in poverty because people in poverty sometimes only eat twice a day. And, um, that's, you know, that extra meal is huge. So, um, that along with the fact that um, people at the church um, know how to talk like the middle class and they will teach you how to do an interview if you ask them. And if they see that you're struggling with getting a job, then they can come and help you. Uh, there's a lot of things that churches do that they don't get any credit for. Um, we just hear them talk about religion. But the fact of the matter is, is that the people make up the church and the people in it uh, have a lot of skills that can really help. Um, people in poverty. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point because obviously they go beyond offering uh, spiritual support. Uh, they, yes. like you said, they uh, may offer some of these um, hidden rules of middle class. And I, I want to go back to the topic of language. And uh, in the book, um, there's a pretty good description of the differences between the kind of talk people of poverty in poverty do versus middle class. And we're talking about differences in the grammar and the sentence structure. So middle class people seem to be um, taught to, to have very well-formed sentences. People living in poverty, their discourse is more of the entertainment type. There's no periods, there's no commas it it just goes on and uh humor is very valued and you need to to yeah. know to appreciate that um the the book also talks about how for instance pe uh, poor people look at food versus middle class versus the wealthy for the poor people it's all about quantity for the middle class it's all about quality for the wealthy it's about presentation and provenance and things like that it, it yeah. was a quite eye-opener it is it is and and um children who grow up in poverty um i mean 
learning the hidden language will give you clues to who um, actually grew up in poverty because the truth is as an adult even when you uh, climb out of poverty you really have all of those uh, tales right I mean anybody coming to my house or listening to me about food will know that my refrigerator is packed to the gills all the time even though things are rotting even though I know that the store is five minutes away um, my pantry is packed Everything is packed because I'm afraid deep down inside uh, that I may not have enough food, even though I know that's not true. <laughs> I know that's not true. Uh, I know that I can grow my food if I had to, and I know where to go uh, to get free food. So I know it's not true, but I still have it. Um, I, I think that learning who and what and, and where they came from helps you to meet people where they're at. You can't really help people unless you do that um, in a non-judgmental way. And um, it also helps you when they have different uh, tics and they say things that are just really odd. Uh, and you're like, what is that? Uh, and they use a lot of slang. And people uh, who've, who've come out of poverty will go back to that, especially in times of stress. So... Um, people need to be understanding of that and and uh, work with that. So, yeah. You know, there are 37.2 million people in the United States that are living in poverty, according to, I think, a 2020 census. And it, it's a, an incredible number. Um, and it makes me wonder, what can we do about it? And you also look at what's happening worldwide and you could see more poverty. And um, like, who do you help first? Who do you start with? Is US poverty different than the, you know, people, the refugees from Syria living in Turkey for years in a row now um, in tents and with limited access to education? or you know, people that have been affected by COVID or by um, sea level rises in Bangladesh. Who, who, like, who do you jump to help first? How do you do this? How do you cover it all? Well, I, I think that, that once you get to thinking broad terms, most people get overwhelmed and then they don't do anything. <laughs> um, so what I tell people when they ask me is um, start with your community. Start with um, how you can help the homeless or the po people in poverty um, and because they're all around you, right? They're in these communities that we live in. Um, help by volunteering at a not-for-profit or an organization that affects you in your community. So um, that, that's what I think is the best idea. I, I don't know. I mean, I feel really bad about all these people worldwide. But if everybody could just help a little in their communities, then at least we could take care of what's at home. Um, and then maybe we could uh, start looking out to other places and help them. But I really think you probably should help the, your neighbor um, first. First. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, the the author's state that there are three causes to poverty and one is the lack of affordable housing which we're experiencing here in Maui we're and in Hawaii we have a crisis in our hands right now uh, when it comes to affordable housing and um, the other cause is the fact that there is an attitude of called the NIMBY attitude not in not in my backyard meaning that you know, developers and people generally don't want to see affordable housing projects in their neighborhood. Um, and um, last but not least, the authors point out that the mortgage interest deduction is also contributing to poverty or is not limiting poverty. And th this was very interesting for me. I haven't gotten a chance to research more about it, why, why that is, but I will definitely will do so. Do, do you have any input on these issues? I don't have any in, in, input on the mortgage interest, even though it's fascinating. I, I'll look that up myself. Um, but what I, I do think that uh, Hawaii is quite different than a lot of places, right? 
uh, or at least um, where uh, Maui is uh, very different. Uh, Hawaii has a very big homeless camp over there. Um, what I'm seeing in the United States is people like Arizona that has um, never seen homeless like they've seen. And I believe an article came out just a few days ago where they had about 800 people living on the street. Uh, that's an enormous amount of people in that heat. And um, we are seeing uh, a lot of people, well, they are seeing actually lots of people coming out of California, buying affordable housing, turning um, you know, it into uh, rentals and upping the price, thus making the working class and the working poor actually be shoved out of the housing market and go into the street. Um, what the answer is, I don't know, but somebody needs to do something because we can't have a bunch of people in every major city living on the street. Uh, first of all, who allows that kind of thing? <laughs> I mean, do we just not care about human beings now? Um, I mean, really, who allows that? And what are we gonna do about that? Uh, there has to be an answer. Um, I know that Arizona was like, well, we're going to sanction so that you can have a tent city. But I mean, is that really the answer? I mean, do we really want to say, okay, it's, it's fine that you live on the street? I mean, you got sanitation problems, you got trash problems, you got uh, where do they shower? I mean, you've got a million different issues uh, when you allow things like that. Um, so I, I think that the government ought to have some sort of viable solution. Um, because I, I don't think that this is going to get any better. I mean, inflation is at what, 40%? That's quite a bit. Um, I mean, even if it goes down. Yeah, on, on rentals, yes, uh, or cost of living. Exactly. And if, and if you think about this, the fact is, if you get pushed down into the street and you live in a tent, all your possessions are in the tent. And um, theft is rampant. So you go to work and you come back and if you don't have anybody watching your stuff or maybe the person watching your stuff isn't watching it well enough and they steal from you then basically you're getting just a little bit of money and then you're going to have to replace all the stuff that they stole making it even harder to actually get into um, a low-income housing the other thing is, is that people in poverty need an address that's the biggest thing um, they can't get a birth certificate sent to someplace, which is almost all the birth certificates after COVID are online. And um, but if you don't have a post office box, or you don't have a place to send your mail. You, um, there's what are you going to do about that? There's nothing. And if you go to a bank, open a bank account, they want to know address. What if you don't have one? What are you going to do now? Yeah. It, it's so, interesting how how these things can be such. I mean, buried. major challenge. Yeah, yeah, such barriers. Yeah. yeah, major barriers, which seem so simple to the rest of us, right? We don't even think about it. In the middle class, you don't even think about who's going to have your address uh, or where you're going to send mail. Uh, but in the real world, that's a big deal. Well, I feel like I definitely want to figure out or learn more about how to solve this affordable housing um, issue. In, I, I look at Maui as a social experiment because many um, people have left, primarily middle class, and the ones that have returned are not um, people that require, that will you know fill in those jobs. On the contrary, they will need to be uh, provided services um, by people in middle class and um, people living in poverty. So uh, it's, it's the biggest social experiment at this point, and I'm waiting to see how it will unfold. But um, Jeannie, I thank you so much for joining me today. It's always wonderful to, to talk with you about just anything. So uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll, I hope you'll be back on the show. I will, I will. Thank you for having and me, I, I enjoyed it. This book has been a favorite I, I of mine for years. I, I know you recommended it to our book club and it was absolutely excellent. And I it stuck with me over the years and I'm so glad that it's been updated and um, enhanced. So 
uh, to all our viewers, I hope that you will read this book and I hope that you will feel inspired to do something in your community to reduce poverty. And um, until next time, ahui ho. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.